Welcome back to Ty and That Guy. My name is Wes Chatham, and with me, as always, is my okay friend and uh, regular golf caddy, Ty Frank. How are you doing today, Ty? Uh, I'm doing I'm doing great, Wes. Uh, but I gotta say, um, okay, friend. <laughs> Well, you, you don't sound very good. You sound a little sick, and I don't want to get, I don't want to catch anything. But that, I mean, but you don't have to downgrade our friendship. It's usually good friend. <laughs> Is that what happens when people around you get sick? You just abandon them? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't want to be friends with anybody who dies. So, like, the sicker you get, the less we're going to be friends. Ah, uh, okay. That's that's why none of my friends have ever died. It's because as they were dying, I just stopped being friends. Or well, what happens when they get sick and then they recover? <laughs> is it awkward? Well, then, then? then our friendship can our friendship can rebound. Then. Uh, but is it a rebound? Like if somebody gets really fucking sick and might not come back and they're in the hospital and you're nowhere to be found, and then miraculously they come through and make it, and then you've been disappeared for six months while they're battling this disease. When you come back, do they accept you in the relationship? I don't know. That's never happened. I, I, I'm excited to try it though. I'm excited to experiment. Okay. All right. Um, well, that's good to know. I figured that you'd be always there by my side, by my bedside. But uh, since you asked, um, uh, the reason I'm not feeling well, Ty, is I haven't been getting a lot of sleep lately because I just got back from Costa Rica. And as you know, I'm a big fan of the, uh, of the plant medicine. And uh, I had uh, quite a few ceremonies. But one of the ceremonies that uh, really marked the whole occasion was with a mushroom called penis envy. Have you heard of this mushroom? <laughs> no. That's what it's called. That is what it's called. I mean. Wow. Uh, so you're, you're finally dealing with those deep-seated emotional <laughs> issues you have. Joseph. And you found the, you found the correct mushroom to deal Joseph, with. Joseph, am I right? Uh, is, it, is it called penis TV or is that a nickname they gave him? Because, you know, it's we straight had up called penis envy and I have a bunch in my freezer right now. Oh, I'm so, dude, those things get ready to blast off, baby. But so we're in Costa Rica, and and I'm going to use, because uh, I'm not sure everybody's as open with me as my uh, plant medicine use, but I'm going to use aliases. So nobody's real name is in this, because there's people that, in this story, that you, they don't want to, you know, they're not as open as me. But <laughs> there's a story. So we did, uh, me and my buddy Kevin, we'll say Kevin, I'll just give you an example. He is a he was a corporate accountant for most of his life, or a, a, a job like that. So uh, he's not the coolest, most savvy drug dealer, let's just say the least. And so we were like, "Look, we got this major set of ceremony set up, whatever. But let's have a let's have a, a night of like a warm up, right? Because when the ceremony comes, I'm going balls to the wall. I'm going deep. I'm going I'm going penny penis envy deep." And, uh, and so we're like, all right, let's see if we, let's get some shrooms. And so when I get to Costa Rica, I don't know much about Costa Rica, but I immediately like the vibe. I mean, there's, it's just so relaxed and so chill and the food is great and healthy and people are like surfers and, and yoga teachers and they're shamans and all this stuff. So I was like, oh, wow, this must be drugs might, must not be a big deal here. You know, they must like, people must not care about drugs. And so we're like, let's go get some shrooms. So my buddy Kevin, who bought this place, he bought it from a guy named Manny. Manny is a builder that knows everybody in this town. And he's somebody that everybody loves, everybody trusts. So Kevin says to his wife, call Manny and find us a shroom person. So next thing you know, we get a call. Um, my wife and his wife are, are uh, they're shopping and they said, Hey, we got the shroom hookup. Would you mind going to get it? He wants you to meet in downtown at this certain place. And uh, we were in Santa Teresa and we were driving to Tambor uh, and meet at this certain place. We're like, yes, yeah. so we get on our four wheelers. We're driving fucking beautiful, man. The sun is like, ju- it's starting to get in the afternoon. So it's that golden light fucking hairs blowing. We're driving, we're passing cows and all this stuff. And I, and I feel a hundred percent safe. Because I figured, like, you know, Costa Rica was cool about, about drugs and everything like that. Also, this guy is referred to us by Manny, who's, like, beloved in this area, I guess. So we pull up to where we're supposed to meet the guy, and we pull up early. But when we pull up, there's cops everywhere at the storefront that we're supposed to meet this guy at. 
So I pull up and I and I and I get a little bit like nervous. Like it reminded me of you know that feeling in your gut in high school when you have when you're doing something wrong and you see a cop car and that like it, it, it's like an old school feeling. And <laughs> that's how long I you know broke the law. And so uh, so we see that there's cops everywhere, and we're I mean we're not you know skilled criminals because we went to the ATM to get money out because we have a big uh, <laughs> we have a big purchase yep, a large drug purchase yeah we have a large man. drug purchase so we need cash so we're like oh while the cops are there we'll just go across the street to the bank and pull out some cash where there's all kinds of cameras that will right. and and documentation that were there yeah make, make sure you get your face on as many <laughs> yeah. cameras as possible so yeah. because i see these cops but i'm not connecting it to our and, and i'm saying isn't this weird well kevin starts to get a little sweaty under the collar and we're in there you know get, and we were early we we're like 15 minutes early so he takes out his money, and then we're hanging out, you know, on our foot, just sitting in the parking lot looking at the cops. The cops are noticing us looking at them. And, uh, and then he's, he says, I'm getting a little nervous because I, he watches this show called Locked Up Abroad. And he was telling me all these stories <laughs> about people getting locked in these horrible prisons in the country. And, yeah. and I was like, yeah, but this isn't elite. Like, these aren't elite. Like, Costa Rica doesn't care about mushrooms and stuff like that. And he goes, I don't know, let's check. So then we go to Google if mushrooms were illegal in Costa Rica. And I've been there. I haven't even been there 24 hours. So we're Googling it, but I don't have a signal. So I can't pull up what the penalty are and how strict Costa Rica is. So then I start saying, well, what if this is a fucking big deal? Like, what if they take, you know, travelers and throw their asses in jail, you know? And, 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 and then I started getting a little like, hmm. And I, but I thought, you know what? Manny referred this guy. So if he referred this guy, he knows the drill. And, and this guy's not stupid. He knows it too. The whole time we're there, the cops never leave. More cops show up. And I'm talking cop cars and cops standing in the storefront that we're meeting this guy. So then we're like, well, what if they're, <clears throat> what if this guy is setting people up? Because by the way, I don't know anything about this guy because he, neither does, does Kevin because Kevin's wife just uh, texted us on WhatsApp and said, hey, you know, just go, uh, you know, pick up these things. This is where he's going to meet. Gave us all the instructions. So then I'm sitting there waiting and I'm like, uh, well, this guy, when he shows up, he'll know the drill, you know, cause you know, he's lives there, whatever. And, and I thought he was, I like, I thought he was shaman surfer long, you know, sweet looking guy. So he calls me on the phone. And when he calls me, he's like, Hey, uh, I was going to meet you guys, but do you see what's there? And I, and he put, and then I was like, Oh fuck. Like, if he's worried about the cops, and I'm, and then this shit is illegal, and we are doing a drug deal, and this is a big thing. And he goes, so listen, here's what we're going to do. First of all, I'm like, how did you call me? How do you even know my number? And Kevin's wife said, oh, let me give you Wes's number. We don't know this guy. And so wow. he gives him my number. <clears throat> so we're already breaking all the drug dealer rules, right? And, and Kevin the whole time is in my ear and he's all sweaty and, 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 and he's like, man, I've been watching that locked up abroad and this is, they're always doing stupid shit like this. And I always thought I would never do stupid shit, but we're doing stupid shit. So, yeah. and I was like, calm down, calm down. Manny wouldn't put it. By the way, I've never met Manny, but everybody talked like Manny's been like the guy that everybody talked. Oh, Manny's great. Oh, he knows everybody, everything. He's just, you know. Okay. This is now being added to the list of stupid shit <laughs> that you're just yeah. assuming this guy wouldn't fuck. You right, right, right. But, because but, some, but some other people think he's cool. But I'm going by <laughs> Kevin's story of Manny. Manny's saying. Because Manny was his end to everything in Costa Rica. Uh, Kevin has a house there. He has everything. So I was like, listen, you know Manny, right? And he said, yeah. He goes, Manny wouldn't put us in a fucked up situation, whatever. So the guy that we're going to be meeting for the shrooms, he calls and says, hey, all right, there's a grocery store down the street, and you come and meet me at the grocery store. And I was like, all right. I figured that we would you know, go to the back of the grocery store, whatever, do the thing. At this point, Kevin's like, hey, listen, we should – we should probably just say, you know, abandon mission and, and get the fuck out of here. And I was like, dude, you Kevin sounds like a really smart guy. <laughs> I was like, dude, Kevin, uh, Manny wouldn't put you in a bad situation. He goes, you're right. You're right. Right. So let's go. So we have on folders. We go to the grocery store. The guy calls me and is like, I'm inside the grocery store. Come meet me inside. And I was like, why don't, why don't you meet us outside? Because I don't feel comfortable going outside. Meet me inside the grocery store. 
So I'm like, well, fuck, now we got another set of cameras, and then there's going to be cameras inside or whatever. But I was like, we're already in deep, and, and we looked at each other, and we're like, fuck it, we're going in. So we go into the grocery store, right, with two dipshits that are not Costa Rica cool yet. I'm, I'm Costa Rica cool now, but I wasn't then. And we go walking in, and I'm walking around, and I don't know what this guy looks like, but I'm looking for, like, a shaman, surfer kind of guy. And so we're walking around, and this guy goes, Wes. And I turn around and look, and I'm like, how the fuck? Like, I jumped, like, 10 feet. I, how did he know my name? So I kind of jumped, and I looked. And first of all, how did he know my name, and how did he know who we were when we walked in, unless we looked like the only dipshits looking for drugs? So he called my name. I jumped. I look over. So think less shaman and more San Quentin. <laughs> this guy, this guy, <laughs> I mean, shirt off, no shoes, tatted up, and he's in line with food. Like, he went grocery shopping. He's got food in his thing. <laughs> so he goes, come here, come here. He wouldn't even get out of line to come do this thing. He goes, come here. Well, you don't want to lose your place in line. <laughs> so we roll up. We go up talk to him. And he goes, uh, so he starts talking to us. And then the first thing Kevin says is like, hey, man. And he's like, kind of like, try, and, Kev, and Kevin's scared shitless. And you can see it. And he goes, hey, man, so uh, you're friends with Manny, right? And the guy goes, who the fuck's Manny? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, who the fuck's Manny? And then, and then all of my illusion of like, Manny, this whole thing and all that. And this guy has no fucking idea who Manny is, just drops out. And then I'm like, oh, shit. The stakes have just been rose. So now I'm like, now all the stuff that was holding my logic together was gone. And I'm like, first of all, who is this guy? Why is he trying to sell drugs with us in a grocery store line with a thing full of food? And so now I'm like, I just want to get the fuck out of here. And Kevin just wants to get the fuck out of here. There is literally a block away, a whole block full of cops just walking around. And we, and you know, we had a lot of stuff in this bag. We made a big order. So then when he's there, he goes, okay, guys, now, uh, he goes, I know you, you know, I know you made this order, whatever he goes, but I got this thing and he pulled it out and he was upselling us in the grocery line with, with honey mushrooms that like he turned honey like bee honey in with infused with mushrooms or whatever. And he's talking and we're just so like focused and like want to get the fuck out of there. He looks at us and he's like, okay, so no one, the honey, you just want to keep it the regular. Okay. I got it. <laughs> and we, we didn't say a word. So he gives me the bag, pulls the bag out of a shopping cart, which is wrapped in a grocery store bag from that place. He gives it to me. Like if we go to jail, we deserve to go to jail. And I should have thought this through. And then I was like, by the way, I'm the one holding the fucking drugs, you know? So we get the, we get the mushrooms. So, so Kevin and I are walking out, and I go, Kevin, we got, I got to buy something. I can't just walk out with all this shit because it looks like I'm shoplifting. And, you know, and, and, and there was people, you know, that by the door and all that stuff. That, but at that point, the train was leaving. Kevin was on, <laughs> he was on the road. He didn't even listen to what I had to say. He was out the door. So I'm like, all right. So we walk out. I just grab the stuff. We walk out. We go outside. And then I'm right at the front door of the grocery store getting on my four-wheeler. He had to walk around the back because he couldn't. He didn't have where to park. So we're right around the back, and I'm sitting there, and I put, I put the stuff in the back of the thing, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just looking at all the cops. I'm looking at all the cars, and I'm waiting, and I'm like, what the fuck is he doing? And I stood up on the four-wheeler to look back where he was, and he's on his fucking phone uh, like before he gets on the trailer and I think he's trying to tell his wife or whatever and I go Kevin let's get the fuck out of here and so then he hops on the four wheeler we hop on the four we drive we drive right through that block of cops I don't know what they're doing there and why they were there whatever. we drive right through them and then we're going and we get to as soon as we get to where we feel like we're safe and the whole time I'm like if they swarm me uh, you know, I, I was, and, and so we, we pull over and we pull over and, uh, and I, and I go, Kevin, and, and we pull over and I go, what's going on? He goes, I just need to wipe my ass. I think I just shit my pants. <laughs> <laughs> and then we start talking and I go, listen, man, um, if, uh, if those cops come and get me, you keep going because somebody's got to bail me. It doesn't make, it doesn't do any good if both of us, you keep going. And he looked at me and I was like, you already, you already, you already figured you already thought about that. Haven't you? He goes, yeah, yeah I did. And I was like, you're going to keep going anyway. He said, yeah, yeah, I did. Anyway, we, uh, we, we got back and we got back with the shrooms and it, we had an amazing night an amazing warm up, And then we had, uh, the, uh, a, a ceremony where we went, we went into the stratosphere. It's pretty, pretty incredible.
Okay, so you know, you know, I like you. You know, I think you're a, a smart guy. We've had a lot of conversations that I really respect, but that's the dumbest fucking thing that anyone has ever done. That that's like that's like invading Russia levels of dumb. Yeah. Yeah. Like there there is no reason you are not in a Costa Rican prison right now. And and here and here's the thing. <laughs> I agree with you a hundred percent. Oh, I know no, I know yeah, you yeah, do. Yeah. I know, I'm not telling you yeah. anything you don't already it, know. It is the like it is the dumbest fucking thing. And and when I get my mind set on something, and the thing is, is like I had my mind setting like I want to do this and like if I am in the States and I'm in that atmosphere, but when you when I got to Costa Rica, it was just all of a sudden I was like Oh, they nobody cares about. There's no laws. Yeah, there's here. It's Costa Costa nobody, Rica. nobody gives a shit. Like, they, what do they care about this stuff? Whatever, we're gonna do this. And uh, and then I just got swept up in the vibe and everything. And then I realized, like, it was so stupid. It was so stupid. It was so stupid. And you left such a trail because you're on all those cameras. All the cameras. Um, you were using WhatsApp to set this up. They're owned by Facebook. Facebook absolutely will turn your shit over to the cops. Right. So you got a paper trail there. He called you, which means now you have a phone record of you being on the phone with this drug dealer. Yeah. I mean, like, like if, if you're watching, um, like, Law & Order, this is the case that they don't lose. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know. It, and then we made a fucking podcast. And now you made a podcast admitting to all your guilt. We were. Uh, we, but every step of the way, I, I, when, when, when he called me, I was like. I don't want any phone trades in this. We went to the ATM at the bank. I was like, this, by the way, I didn't go to the ATM. Kevin went to the ATM. But when, when he came back, I was like, this is, you know, this is going to be on camera. When he said, go in the grocery store, I knew there's cameras in the grocery store. Every step of the way, I ignored my own inner voice. Because you wanted the thing. Because I so wanted the thing. you were going to justify every yeah, step. Yeah. Yep. So whenever I see people on TV doing stupid shit, I'm like, I would never do some stuff like that. Well. That's not true. Yeah. No, you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not true. Here's the thing is, is like, everybody has that stupid in them. Uh -huh. Everybody. I don't care how smart you are. Everybody's got that stupid in them. And the only thing is what triggers it. Yeah. You know, what is the thing that you want that you will justify the stupidest behavior to get? Like, everybody's got it. Like, our friend, like, if you have a friend that's hot and lust for a girl or hot and lust for a guy yeah. and this stupid shit they do and you're like what can yeah, you see and you're see like this? why are you doing that so yeah you get but i was so yeah. wrapped up in costa rica and and wanting to work with the plant medicine that and, and i guess too the way i look at like you know psilocybin mushrooms whatever i just it just don't, they just don't feel criminal to me something that you know come it, it, it's it's and yet they still are in most places. yeah and i still don't know if they are because actually i do know that they are technically illegal in costa rica but it's not you know strongly you were so spun on the reputation of a guy named manny who you never met that well that's the <laughs> that's the that is the that's the the punchline of the story is that no 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 the punchline of the story is who the fuck is Manny? that's that's what i'm saying the, <laughs> oh, okay. the punchline of the story was my the, this whole thing was hinging on nah man manny wouldn't do it and i'm and i'm talking as and i never met this guy and I'm like, nah, Manny would never put us in this thing, never. So finally, when Kevin's like, hey, you friends with Manny? And he goes, who the fuck's Manny? <laughs> that whole illusion that I had just crumbled. And I was like, you don't know who fucking Manny is? <laughs> like, and it turns out that Kevin's wife couldn't get a hold of Manny. So she called other acquaintances that, like, you could, if you could even, that in Costa Rica and was like, and then they connected her with this guy. So it's. An acquaintance of an acquaintance of an acquaintance. I, I do love, think less shaman and more San Quentin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I picture this like, like a lot of people. First of all, Costa Rica's got the most beautiful people I've ever seen. So I was picturing like a surfer, you know, blonde mane, golden tan, or dark mane, golden tan. And, uh, and we pull up and it's like, no, this guy, he, he he's... He's running from the States from something. <laughs> well, that's a great story. Yeah. Um, what are we talking about I'm today? Glad you did, I'm glad you didn't wind up in a Costa Rican yeah. prison. Next, next, um, next episode, we'll talk about the ceremony. All right. Now, that's, that's good. The other thing that happened just today 
is the release of the last episode of the show. Season six, episode six. Is six. Episode six. Nice. Season six, episode six. <laughs> I know it's on your mind. Uh, released today. The, yeah. the penis yeah. even envy talk got you all hot and bothered. No, it was the prison talk. <laughs> prison talk always gets me uh, worked up. Um, did you uh, yeah, so, did you read the Ringer article today that came out about us? Um, I think somebody sent it to. I mean, I, I may have skimmed it. Yeah, that's me. Uh, I'm getting asshole. a lot of. <laughs> you never returned. Uh, I oh, was that you? Yeah, it was that you. Yeah, no, I'm getting a ton of press stuff being sent to me right now, so I'm only able to kind of skim through most of it. Right. Let me. I'm going to look for it because we should read. But it seemed complimentary, as I recall. I want to read the last article of this Ringer article, and, and I'm a fan of the Ringer, and I, uh, and I, and so it's it's always feels good when they write something about the show, and uh, this is this is about the finale, and it said the Expanse endure, endured a tumultuous journey to complete six seasons, which is already long shelf life in the streaming age, through a combination of intricate world building, political intrigues, shocking twists, compelling ca- characters. And impressive production values, The Expanse became the best science fiction series of its era, if not the best of all time. For all the worthy comparisons to Game of Thrones, there's one thing The Expanse achieved that its HBO counterpart did not. This show stuck the landing. Yeah, I, I saw that. I saw that quote. That's a really nice quote. That's a yeah. excellent, excellent quote. Um, it's really nice. I noticed they did not mention the top notch acting. They they when in their list of in their list of things they did not mention top notch acting. I, I I noticed the absence. Well, of that's that. fair to me, but it's not fair to Sheree or 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 drummer <laughs> or uh, or uh, Nomi, D- Dominique or Steven. Wow, you're still yeah, you still got some leftover mushroom because you were slurring. You were like Nominique. Well, I was gonna say Naomi, and then I was like, oh, Dominique, and I was like Nominique, and then Stolden. Yeah. You know, that's actually uh, Nominique is good because you know I always call uh, Frankie Frankie Bobby. Yeah, we need we need. I, I, she's just melded into one thing for me, so Nominique is good. And Dom, Dom does not like nicknames, though. She does like, not to... like nicknames, and she gets pissed off if you call her by her character name. Yeah. Because, you know, when you do seven years of a thing, like, you know, so I say, I say Naomi all the time, or I'll say, you know, Bobby to Frankie all the time. Yeah. And, uh, and she's like, my name, is, my name is not Naomi. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad. Well, somebody early on, I think it was in season one, when she's still... Uh, Dom was not as, um, I would say, confident you know, on set as she later became, obviously, um, because it was her first really big you know, lead part. So in season one, she still was not quite as confident. And the one time I heard her speak up is one of the other actors whose name I will not say called her like sweetie or honey or something like that. She was not having that, man. She just unloaded on that person. Did this person like, call her that in the context of a scene, or did he call her that no. just personal? Like just personal. Oh, like just yeah. yeah. Said so she said she was gonna do something, and he said, "Oh, hey, uh, I think it's over there, sweetie." And she was like, "Nope, <laughs> not having it." Ooh. Yeah, guy obviously that was, didn't. That know. was that was in the first season. That was the first time I saw the real Dominique. Right, like the the curtain opened a little bit. I'm like, oh, I see who's back there. Yeah. yeah, and then you know, as the seasons went on, she, her confidence level went way up, and you got to see the real Dominique more and more often. But that first season, she was a little more, a little, little shyer until that happened. So I know not to call her by nicknames. Do you think that she was intimidated by our ferocious talent? I'm sure that's what it was. Yeah. I'm sure every time she was on screen with you, she was like, "How am I going to keep up with the monster of acting talent <laughs> that is Wes Jada?" Um, I, I'm, I, I'm sure she went home every night, wrote in her diary that she knew she would never be able to keep up. Well, with I, that's one of fell asleep on her crying on. Well, her that's pillow. one of the things I was concerned about with Jared Harris. You know, it's like, you know, I was like, when he comes on set, he's probably going to be a little intimidated, but you know, yeah, like yeah. we should all work to make him comfortable because, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I just, uh, I wanted to look out for him and not, and not intimidate him. Um, you know. well, and, and, you know, I mean. He's like some British guy, right? I mean, are they, have there ever been good British actors? 
Uh, I don't think so. I don't. I don't think. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Is there anybody? It's not not a country known for. Yeah. Is there anybody that's come talent? out of England that was worth a shit with acting? You know. Yeah. I don't know. Hard to think of. One. I don't know. Oh no no no. Um, Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman. That's right. He's the exception that proves the rule. Yeah. Alan Rickman. He's the one guy. In uh, in reality, Jared Harris's father, Richard Harris, is the greatest actor of all time. One of the greatest actors of all time. Him and one of the greats. Him and, and and not only was he one of the greats, which he clearly was, but just a beautiful man. Yeah. Like like every woman of that era and a, probably a fair number of the guys too, were all about Richard Harris. Just a, Olivier, Richard Harris, Richard Burton, yeah, Burt Reynolds, um, and uh, Anthony Hopkins. Some of the greats there. Is this a list of all the people you want to have sex with, Buzz? <laughs> yes. Yes. Don't shame him. What are we talking about today, Ty? Uh, mushrooms. And uh, episode six of season six. And your list of um, actors you want to sleep with. And I, I mean, we probably have a few minutes to talk about uh, season four, episode six. Um, if you want to do yeah, that. Yeah. Um, where are the mushrooms? I bet the Belters have great mushrooms. Yeah, they would. And, and yep. well, they 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 eat. I mean, they grow mushrooms within like the the water vents, right? I mean, that's yep. so. Yep. But uh, I wonder if they grow the psilocybin kind of in there. I'm sure. I'm sure some enterprising uh, belter. Uh, what do they call it? Amateur pharmacologist. Uh-huh. It's growing growing some mushrooms in his dorm room. Have you ever eaten mushrooms? I do not. I I stay very far away from um, hallucinogens. Why? Uh, because there are some very black places in my soul, and I have no. I keep them felt. I keep them locked away, carefully bottled up in a iron chest wrapped with chains right. at the core of my being, and I have no interest in doing anything that opens any of those locks. Listen, Clint is just a degenerate as you are, and he's got a black heart, and he does shrooms all the time. No, Clint. Clint is a lovely man who is even as we speak cradling his new baby and feeding it the, he, clint is not the black heart that i am there's no chance oh you, you do not know clint very well and that baby is did you ever see rosemary's baby <laughs> <laughs> clint belongs to those to that to that tribe that cult. that cult yeah so yes it was episode six of season four uh this one is uh our good friend jeff will know and written uh, as the director, and, and written by and Hallie, Hallie, Hallie Burton Lambert, our good friend. Well, I I yeah, I call her I call her uh, Halliburton. So oh, yeah, her yeah official name is Hallie Burton. Hallie Burton. One of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about today because this episode is uh, it's really crafted and structured well, and it's really a lesson in rising tension. And I kind of want to just go. So we're at a point now where we know who every, all the characters are, who, what they want. We care about the ones that we're supposed to care for. We root for the ones that we don't want to root for. So we are emotionally involved. We're in this story. It is set up properly. And this is the episode where shit starts to hit the fan. And I, and I just thought it, watching it, I thought it was so well done in terms of the, the tension and the rise in action and that tension going across multiple scenes with different characters, just something just to kind of go into the craft of it a little bit. And before we started uh, talking about this, you were telling me about this French editor. It's a uh, Russian. I'm sorry, Russian, this Russian editor. Yeah. If you want to talk a little bit about the, is it the, what is it called? The, the effect, the. Yeah. Uh, Clint, remind me of the name. Oh, I closed that tab on my computer a long time ago. Kolovov? Kolovov? Yeah, Mikhail. Molotov? Molotov cocktail? <laughs> yes. Wow. Clint, you had one job. You got one you job, had, Clint. You had one Mikhail job. Mikhail Kolotov. And, Kolotov. And, Clint, when I was going in about your black heart, you didn't come in and, and, and help me out when he was saying you're a good guy. Too real. <laughs> Too close. Yeah, so, so Kolotov was a Russian uh, film professor, one of the early pioneers of film in Russia. And um, way back at like the turn of the century, he did experiments with his students, with his film students uh, on editing. 
And one of the things that he did was he would edit together like little five and 10 second segments of film of different things. And he would reorder them. And then he would at, so it'd be like a, a segment of a little girl petting a puppy and a segment of flies crawling on rotting meat. And then a segment of a person looking at the sunset. And then a segment of like waves crashing on the ocean, just a bunch of unrelated things. And then he would edit them together in different orders. And he would ask his students what the emotional content of each of those segments was. And of course it would change. So like if, if you put like somebody looking at the setting the sun and then a little girl petting her puppy and they say, what, what is that segment with the little girl petting the puppy mean? And they'd be like, Oh, it's, you know, it's taking time to enjoy, you know, the sun is setting, but taking time to enjoy the things that matter to you in life, you know, that kind of thing. Then he would edit it where it was the little girl petting the puppy and then flies crawling on rotting meat. And then it's like, what is the little girl petting the puppy mean? And they'd be like, Oh, it's about, you know, the impermanence of life and, and that, you know, all, no matter what, it, how much you love something, it's eventually going to die. And what he put together was a thing that came to be called the Kolotov effect, which is that any two edited scenes, the preceding scene will change the emotional content of the succeeding scene, whether or not those two scenes are related to each other in any other way. So even a cut from, like, if you're in one storyline and you cut to a completely different storyline, the emotion of that previous scene in that previous storyline will the audience carries that with them to the new scene. And as a writer and an editor, you have to be aware of that because you, you can't just ignore the, though if you have an incredibly tense scene and you cut to a different scene, you can't ignore in the writing that the people still have the tension from that previous scene, or it feels like it, it feels uh, jarring. It feels like a bad edit. Because if you just cut into something that has a completely different emotional content to it, it, it's, it feels like you stuttered. And so when you're writing or editing, you have to be very aware of each of these scenes, whether or not they're narratively related, are still informing the scenes that follow. Um, so anyway, that was what we were talking about. Is, and and as, a, as a filmmaker, you have to be very aware of that, uh, no matter what sort of your job in filmmaking is, that, that those things all carry through. And I think if you break, uh, particularly on the illness, you break down the beats of what happens to them. It's such a great example of how to create rising tension on the external level, but also on the internal, internal level. And it's, it's, going, it's, it's, it's ramping up at the same time. So we start off this episode and uh, Alex and Naomi, they figure out that hell is coming. And there is these supernatural disasters that are just coming in waves and uh, they need to evacuate immediately. Yeah. And Holden has this task. And you talk about like complicating problems and stuff because the more complicated and entangled things are, the more interesting it is to root out, especially if you care for them. So now Holden, he has these two group of people that want to exterminate each other um, or at least a step away from killing each other. And now he's got to get them all on the same page to go and evacuate, uh, to leave this land. And the only way he's able to do that is if he tells Chiwewe that uh, she says, look, you know, if you can tell Avasarala, you know, put in a word for us, if you can. And so he goes, I'll give you my word. I'll do whatever I can to make sure that your settlement here stays legit. Well, now he pisses off Murdy and now he loses right. the cooperation from Murdy. So he's trying to hold this. This, uh, this whole thing together. And one of the ways that w makes this really interesting, all this is going, is that how you guys created the internal and the external. And an example of the internal is all these other circumstances are happening, but uh, Felsia learns that her daughter is now on the Barbara Picola and that she's safe. And so Alex puts them through her in transmission. She's happy to see her. But her daughter, found the, her daughter found out of what she did. And she doesn't know the whole story, but she knows that she was involved with all these people dying and blowing up the platform. So she has this resentment and hatred and then shuts off the, shuts off the feed. Well, now you find out that the barbacola and the reactors, the protomolecules doing its thing, and the reactor shutting down. Number one, they're not going to be able to go evacuate all the people on the planet. But number two, the Barbara Picola will be the first one to fall into the atmosphere and burn alive. And her daughter is on that ship. 
So now you're adding on every level, pushing these characters to the very, uh, the, their very brink because, you know, it's, it makes it really more interesting. Do you, is when you were, uh, when you guys were kind of crafting this in the writer's room, is that one of the things that was, is that one of the mechanisms of creating this, uh, need for her to kind of, to look up to Naomi, the daughter and, and want to go and travel off world. So then she would be in this situation. Yeah. I mean that, that is from the, you know, the book that, that the barb is going to fall out of the sky and that they have to figure out a way to save it. Now the, the solution to that is very different in the book, but the, the emotional core is the same, which is you, you have two people who believe that they're safe because they're in space, you know, the parent and the child. And so you have that moment of release of tension. We're like, Oh, thank God. My daughter that I thought was, was going to die or it was in trouble or maybe Morty had killed her. She's safe now. She's on the ship, surrounded by friends. She's safe. And then realizing that actually, by getting out of one dangerous situation, she has been placed in a much more dangerous situation. Having all that connected to her relationship to Naomi, as we go on, as we get to the later episodes, is, is yeah, I mean, part of it is that, that her relationship to Naomi is what makes Felsia feel like it's okay for her to leave so she can go off to university and become an engineer. But it also puts her in a position, her connection to Naomi and her interest in engineering is also puts her in a position to be part of the solution. Because as we'll see in later episodes, Felsia becomes an important part of the solution to the problem too. So it's, it's that, that relationship between the two of them is carrying a lot of, a lot of water. Um, it's, uh, it's got a lot of different story plots. But you know, from somebody that has kids now, and, and I watched that, what Felsia did, like, I, I would, the amount, like, if something like that happened to my kids and I found out that they just ran away and they got under the ship, they're going, there's going to be hell to pay. I'm going to get to them <laughs> on that ship because the amount of fear, and, and, I mean, that is such a selfish thing to do for the parents. And even just leave a fucking note, Felicia. Leave a note for the dad. And you're in orbit. They can't come get you. Like, don't just to fucking abandon them. And the only way that the dad even knew is because they found her stowed away. <clears throat> yeah. Now, she's, you know, in the show, she's like, she's like 18. Mm -hmm. You know, she's a teenager. Are you trying to tell me you didn't do shit that stupid when you were 18? Yeah. I did some pretty stupid shit when I was 18. That's why I prefaced with saying, now yeah. as a parent... And then I go back and I look at this shit and I'm like, you know, this is a, this is a horrible fucking thing. If she left a letter, I could understand it. But the fact that she just stowed away and took off, you know, it reminds me, if I think of you, it, this would be fun. <clears throat> so if I say a, a child running away, what movie first comes to your mind? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you mine. Like a movie based on the premise of a child running away from home. Did you ever see a movie called Savannah Smiles? Yeah. Yeah, I I have seen that. I think that is such a great just a sweet little movie with this little this little girl ends up running away and she stows away in this car and it happens to be escaped convicts from prison. And then these convicts they take off with her and they're like, Well, I guess we can get a ransom from her. Um, but they end up it's a love story between them and the little girl and they end up, you know, having such a great relationship and an adventure with each other that they end up giving the girl back. But then at the end they take him to jail, and then it's it's a it's a heartbreaker. But it's it's uh, anyway. I just as soon as I said girl running away, I started thinking about that movie, and I love that movie. And I'm you've risen in my esteem that you've actually seen that movie because uh, a lot of people haven't. It's fucking it's great. Well, I mean that came out. Uh, what did they come out in the eighties? Yeah, came out early yeah. early eighties. Yeah, no, um, it was that was one of those movies that I think, and I think it was PG. Yeah. And it, so it was one of those, it was one of the few movies my parents would rent at the video store uh, because they only rented PG movies or G movies. Well, and it, and so it was, think, it was also in the HBO rotation in the eighties for yeah. a while. Um, we, we never had HBO cause HBO was filled with filth. Yeah. And, so and you, you didn't, you didn't want that filth in your house. Yeah. Uh, for the grumpy fans that don't like when we go on side tangents, we don't care. Um, <laughs> but you know, another movie I thought about, uh, a little girl, um, one of the greatest movies ever made is The Professional with Natalie Portman. Yep. And when she, you know. Now, she doesn't run away, though. Uh, she, 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 does, she doesn't run away, so just her family gets murdered. No, she runs away because they're getting murdered. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. But, 
And she, <laughs> that's different. That's like yeah. fleeing a crime is different. But I think she would have ran away anyway. The way they created her life and, and what she was you know, younger and dealing with anyway. But that scene, you talk about tension in a scene when she's walking in the hallway and those killers are at their parents' house. Yeah. And so she acts like she's so smart. She acts like, and how good is fucking Natalie Portman in this? I mean, the level of work yeah. that she was doing at this age blows my mind. And then she's knocking on the door and she's like, please answer, please. And he's behind the door with a gun. I mean, you talk about good yeah. fucking writing, good filmmaking, good everything across the board. And Gary Oldman's just the right over the top. Oh, so good. Everyone. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, when Luke Besson was firing on all cylinders, he was one of the best. So, yeah, that is one of, that is one of those movies that he really nailed it. So Holden learns that they can't come down and get him. And Morty tries to send a shuttle down. Now, does the shuttle not have a reactor? Does the protomolecule not affect the, the shuttle? Yeah, no. So th the light shuttle uses chemical rockets. Okay. So it still works. Okay. Yeah, that, the idea is that they can use the chemical rockets on the light shuttle to get up and down, but they can't use anything that requires a nuclear reactor. And the shuttle melts in the fucking <laughs> atmosphere. Was that the atmosphere that melted, or was it the protomolecule just within the atmosphere? Oh, it's actually, it's actually a... One of the orbital weapon plots. So those 13 moons that are up there, we discover, are part of the defense system for the planet because when the shuttle melts is also when that moon turns bright red. See, shit like that is scary to me. You know, you think about the protomolecule, and if the protomolecule had its shit together and it wasn't dead for a billion years, and it was like, like what, how are you going to, what chance do we have against technology like that? You know? By the time humans are, are you know, going out into space if the if the protomolecule builders still existed their civilization is billions of years old they i mean the level of technology that they would have the level of understanding of the universe that they would have would be you know beyond it would be like it would be like us you know like a, a tribe of amoebas trying to declare war on us so we wouldn't even notice them well i mean the thing is is like the universe is so big that if there were, if there was intelligence that was capable of finding and getting to us, and also on the level of caring that we exist, then if they had that kind of technology and that kind of understanding, there's nothing we're going to be able to do. No, you know, so you can you could think about defenses or whatever, but if they can, it, with as massive as the fucking universe is, and they could find and care that we exist, there's nothing you're going to do to those people. Yeah, and and look, I love. An alien invasion movie. I do. Even the bad ones. Even the bad ones. I, I love them. Give, because I just give love an example of a bad one. Uh, like, I, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, Battle Los Angeles. Battle one, LA, uh, really? Battle LA, yeah. I, because it doesn't matter that it's bad. I just love alien invasion movies. I was this close to the, the, the lead in that movie. Were you? Yeah. Oh really? Uh, the the uh, thank you for smoking guy got it right. Um, Aaron I, I never I never Aaron Eckert, I never watched you, yeah, it. Aaron I was Eckert. a little bit uh, upset of it, but um, yeah, it was Aaron, it was Aaron Eckert. Anyway, so I I love alien invasion movies, but the reality is that a species that says technology is sufficient to come to our solar system from wherever they come from, they're just gonna win. There's no like I'm sorry. Your your fighter planes are not going to shoot their ships down uh, Independence Day. That's not going to happen, uh, <laughs> right? You know, and and I, and I'm sorry, Aaron Eckert, your your M4 is not going to defeat their you know advanced alien body armor. Yeah, it just isn't. Um, I'm more I I'm more of a fan of the subtle invasion movies like They Live or the Invasion of the Body Snatchers or things yeah. like that where. They infiltrate secretly without us knowing. That's always more creepy and more interesting to me. By, by the way, Wes, that is the first time anyone has ever described they live as subtle. <laughs> <laughs> I came here to I, if I was, kick ass if I was and just, chew bubble gum. And I'm almost out of bubble a list gum. of subtle movies, they live would not be. Well, honest. their invasion is subtle <laughs> because only, uh, what's his name? Rick Rude. Is that his name? Rick Rude? What's the, no, uh. Rowdy, Rowdy Piper. Rowdy, Rowdy Piper. So the invasion is subtle. Only Rowdy, Rowdy Piper knows of their existence because he finds the glasses. 
They've infiltrated yeah. secretly. So when I say subtle, I mean they didn't come in guns blazing and anything like that. They were secretly yeah. coming in there. Well, and that's um, arrival with uh, or the arrival, whatever it is, or the arrival with Charlie uh, Sheen. Yeah, has that same kind of invasion where they've been here, and they're they're working behind the scenes. Yeah, uh, and that that I mean, okay, so those movies can be fun and all that, but the reason I love alien invasion movies is because I like the scrappy underdog humans fighting back. Yeah. Um. So like. It is not a good movie, but I will watch the shit out of some Battle of Los Angeles or some Independence Day or War of the Worlds, any of that kind of stuff. I will watch the shit out of that stuff because I just want to see, I want to see badass alien technology landing on Earth and some scrappy freedom fighters with, you know, F-16s and, you know, Abrams tanks taking the fight to them. That's what I want to see. <laughs> were, you, were you a fan of uh, the Tom Cruise movie? The War of the Worlds movie? No, the one where it's like he keeps he keeps re- coming back to life. Oh, li- uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Edge of Tomorrow. Edge but of it's Tomorrow. It's actually like Live, Die, Repeat. Yeah. The actual title. Yeah. Yeah. I love that movie. I, I love that movie. I have no shame yeah. about loving that movie. I, I'll fight you I, on that movie. I remember when I first watched that movie because it just slipped through the theaters. I don't even think I heard of it in theaters. And I put it on and I, I was like, this is one of the great fucking, if this movie came out, in the 90s or the 80s, it would be a massive hit. And the fact that nobody cared or paid attention to it blows my mind. It's, it's like Groundhog Day in an alien invasion movie. Yep, that's exactly what it is. And, it's Groundhog and, Day in an alien And his crew's at his best. You know, I mean, he's funny. In that, like, all his deaths and everything. Well, and, he's, and he's not playing a typical crew's character because he's not playing a badass. Yeah, yeah. He starts out, he's lazy, he's insubordinate. Like he's he's a coward. He doesn't want to fight. Like when they burn, they're like, "Oh, we're putting you in with the troops." He's like, "Fuck that!" <laughs> he's trying to get away. Right? Yeah. It's so not the typical cruise role. Yeah. And and uh, uh who's who's the female lead? Um, Emily uh, Blunt. Very famous. Emily actor. Blunt. Uh, Emily Blunt. Emily Blunt's character in that movie is fantastic. Yeah. I loved her character in that movie. The 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 queen of the battlefield. You know, the one who's like the first one who got the the regeneration thing. And so she's just been wrecking shit for the whole war and, and is like, has this amazing reputation. Uh, I loved that character. How come that movie? I wonder why, why do you think it didn't do well? I have no idea. It has all the makings of a great blockbuster. Yeah. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was timing or I don't understand. I don't don't understand the movies. Huh? Did you see the Chris Pratt one, the Amazon Chris Pratt one? I did. How was that? I didn't see it. It's, I'm, I'm apologizing to my Amazon overlords here. It is shockingly terrible. Really? Oh, it's, it's, you can see, you can see why it got dumped onto streaming rather than go to a theater. Cause it was supposed to be a theatrical release. Cause it was a, and it they, was a red hot script when they, when the script was circulating around town. Wow. Okay. So is it like the forever war? Is it a similar premise? No, not at all. Nothing like that. So there's a war in the future, and they were going back and borrowing people from the past to fight the war? Yeah. But that's not what the forever war is. No, 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 it's not. I was saying, you know, I was, yeah. But that is, that is, that is, and look, and that's an okay premise. Like, I don't hate that premise. There's a good movie to be made out of that, but the movie they made is not the good movie version of that script. Right. It's, it's just, it was pretty groan inducing. Yeah. And I, I, again, another apology to my Amazon overlords. I know you guys bought it. Um, I hope it did very well for you. For for the record, yeah. Amazon, I didn't say any, that's all Ty. I didn't say anything <laughs> that's negative all me. about it. That's all me. <laughs> that's not Wes's fault. So now uh, Amos is going through that little hole that they used. To char- and, and I was impressed that uh, the mining charges would be able to blow into that the side of that fortress, the protomolecule fortress. Yeah, well, I mean, the reason they're able to do that is because it's already been unsealed. There's already a gap yeah. to put the charges in. Right. That's, that's why they're able to do it. Yeah. Uh, and that ga- the fact that that door is slightly open, at that there's a gap there, that gets explained later at the end of the season, and it's an important plot point. Right. You know, uh, one of the things that's skillfully done in this episode, and, you know, if people are watching this for the first time or if they're rewatching it, pay attention to how they're building the relationship between Amos and Way, where uh, there's a moment where Way checks in on, or Amos checks in on her, 
And she's like, oh, oh, you care about me? And he's like kind of struck by that. Uh, And so you start to kind of create this, this what looks like uh, a really loving, sweet relationship between two people. But what's happening in Amos's mind about the relationship is completely different than what's happening in Wade's yes. mind. And right before yeah. he's going through the hole in the, in the, she gives him a little smooch. And that, ha- but you know, there's, there's a lot of things going on because Morty checks in with her to make sure that her loyalty is still connected and, and focused on him because he knows that she's getting a little sweet on Amos. And he's like, look, he's your loyalist. She goes, look, if you need me, I need to take this motherfucker out of will. But the, her, uh, the relationship and her emotions are getting a little bit, uh, she's feeling him a little bit more. She's getting a little entangled. A little yeah. entangled. A little entangled. This is definitely in the, the scripts and the story that we crafted, but it's also in your performance that, so when Way talks to you like a friend, Amos is right there. He's, he's very present, right? When Way makes sexual overtures to Amos, he's very present. He's there. Whenever she makes a romantic overture to him, he just looks confused. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like, a big part of him going in. She gives him a kiss. He's like, do you think, yeah. you know, is it safe down there? I don't fucking know. And she gives me a kiss. And it's like, what was that for? You know, and yeah. then he, and then he's kind of going down. And it's like, why did I get a kiss now before I go, you know? Yeah. Cause, because for him, kissing is the prelude to fucking. They're clearly not going to start fucking because he's getting ready to go down through this hole. So why would you start kissing there? It doesn't make any sense. Right. And, and, and that's an important thing to track for his character as, as you're watching the season is, is he understands friendship. He, he has friends. He gets friends, right? He, and, and when Wei acts like his friend, he understands that relationship. That makes sense to him. He understands sex. He likes sex. So when she makes sexual overtures or when she, you know, like is acting in a, an alluring way toward him, he gets that. Like, yeah, oh yeah, later when we have some free time and some, some privacy, we're definitely going to get to that. Privacy is optional. <laughs> But yeah, privacy is, yeah, yeah, you know, hit or miss. Um, but he doesn't get the romance part of it at all. He doesn't understand that piece of it. He's a, what they describe as a romantic. He's, he understands sex. He understands friendship. Romance is a foreign concept to him. And so as she starts to develop these romantic feelings for him, he's not reciprocating them, but he is her friend. He treats her like a friend. And he is her sex partner, and she's reading into those things. But it's not clear that he's not receptive to him because he is acting sometimes as if that is, but he's motivated by a completely different thing. Completely different thing. So when thing. people are watching it, they think they understand the trajectory yep. of this is going. But the reality is is that when they look back and, and see this, this was very carefully built and structured. And it's all yeah, and, and, completely logical and reasonable to what Amos would really do and how he behave. Exactly, exactly. And, and the way we described it in the writer's room is these people are on parallel courses and, they, and they're looking at each other going, oh, we're going the same direction. That means we want the same things. And that's where the mistake comes in. Just because you're both walking in the same direction doesn't mean you want the same things. And the, the tragic mistake that Way makes is she makes that assumption. Oh, he feels about me the way I feel about him. And she has projected that onto him. And that's, as you, you know, when you get to the end of the season, that's a tragic mistake that she has made. Right. Uh, you said that Amos understands friendship. Do you think he abandons his sick friends like you do when they, when they get sick? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the minute that you start to go out because you're sick, Amos is like, I got to find a new friend. So, so do you think... In your life, personally, the only person you would hang by, I mean, I know you would for your wife, but is that pretty much the only person that it, Ty would be holding their hand I, at, in, at mean, the hospital I, on their way out? Obviously, I'm kidding. Obviously, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, have, I have stuck by many of my friends while they were sick. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've, I've been in the hospital with uh, people close to me when they were dying. You know, you got to do it. Yeah. Like, you got to drink some shitty hospital coffee. You got to sit next to that bed. You got to try to be comforting. You got to do it. So uh, Elvia Koye um, starts to discover some weird shit happening within her eyes. And there's this green stuff going on as if they need another fucking problem right now. Around this time when she's discovering that some shit is going down, some suspicious shit is happening with her eyes and something that she's trying to figure out. Holden shows up and is like, we got to fucking leave because the sandstorm is coming. 
which leads to one of the coolest shots of the season when this massive sandstorm hits this building and it the, the power of explodes these windows and the sand yeah. comes in and then there's waves and waves of wind hitting as they get up and you can see the look on Holden's face when he comes up it's like these are just the like these are just the warning winds these aren't even yeah. this is the the big shit hasn't even came yet yep yeah and uh let's give a little shout out to some crew here because obviously that was a stunt and it was a it was a dangerous stunt because we took this little box you know that that set put the the candy glass windows on both sides the the breakable safety glass windows and then we aimed massive air cannons at those windows massive with like so much you know hundreds or thousands of pounds of pressure in the tanks and our longtime uh stunt woman brianna who has often doubled for naomi was doubling for lv in that shot doubling for lindy i should say in that shot and just nails the timing on that jump perfectly uh, because those things, you know, we time those things. The stunt coordinator, there's very specific orders in which things happen. And the timing is like precision, right? Because it's dangerous if it's not. And so certain things were going to happen in a certain order. And Brianna, you know, she's supposed to jump at an exact moment so that she's horizontal when the windows blow in. So that she's not directly in the path of the, of the safety glass when it blows in. And she just fucking nailed it. What a, what a beautiful stunt. So I just had an yeah. idea for an invention. And uh, if you want, you can go into business with me. And, uh, and we'll develop it and make, make uh, Elon Musk money. But wouldn't it be cool to have one of those air cannons rigged to your front door? <laughs> so <laughs> Somebody opens the door and <laughs> blows them down the street. Or, or if somebody is knocking on the door that you just don't want to fucking deal with or talk to, <laughs> just give them a warning. Give them orders, boom, just blow them back on the thing. Or like... It, just have a sign on your door that says, beware of air cannon. Yeah, and nobody knows beware, what that yeah. means. Be, it, yeah, but for legal purposes, you had a sign, but nobody knows what it you means. Had a sign. But, yeah. you know, sometimes when uh, my, my kids' friends come at like 6.30 in the morning and, not, and ring the doorbell because they want to play with my kids, an air cannon would come in handy right then. Yeah. You know, just have a little yeah, buzzer little by the bed. four-year-old just blasting down the street. <laughs> You just you can blast a four year old up in a tree, and he has to stay there until you get up and climb up and take him down. <laughs> so anyway, a little shout out to our stunt crew for that because that was a that was an impressive stunt that they pulled off. I bet on Planet Ty they have that invention on, rigged on every front door. The, the air cannon, the air cannon, the air cannon door. I want that uh, uh, sonic cannon that uh, that they've come up with for crowd control, where it shoots out this subsonic pulse. That makes you feel anxious and frightened and makes you want to leave the area. That's a real thing. They have that. Really? I want that in a 360 degree thing around my house. And so the closer you get to my house, the more scared and anxious you get. <laughs> and just, it's just running all the time. And you like just leave it on days. constantly. Just leave it on constantly. So all the wildlife yeah. are all stressed out and shit around they're your house. They're, like, they're all stressed out. All stressed out. <laughs> the deer, the deer are just like freaked out, man. <laughs> What's yeah. going on? So now this massive fucking tsunami, and I, I just saw it re today. I watched the episode. And I was like, Jesus Christ, that's fucking big. This massive tsunami is coming. And the structure, how tall is that structure? Oh, the alien yeah. structure? It's hundreds of meters high. And this, this high. wave just dwarfs this thing and uh do you know who holden's stunt person was at this time because they did a great job yeah it's and it, I, I i i apologize to this person um did a lot of stunt work for us it's actually maddie berman's kid oh right his son right uh, so matt berman was our stunt coordinator on i think almost every season or most most of the seasons of the show matt berman was our stunt coordinator his kids or at least one of his kids has gone into the business and I, 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 I'm apologizing to Matt and his son because I, it, and I feel really bad that I can't remember his name right now. But, but it was his kid who doubled for Holden in that stunt. And it was a – you know, talking about the one where he dives through with all the water behind him. Yeah. That was another dangerous uh, stunt that he pulled off because he's – obviously he's got a wire to keep him from falling to his death. But he literally hurls his body through that hole – and he's going to try to grab the netting as he comes through and then swing around. Now, if he had failed to grab the netting, he would have fell a few feet and the wire would have caught him. But it probably would have sucked. That would have hurt, right? Yeah. Falling yeah. onto that wire. 
Well, when he do- dove through and there's a water cannon on the other side of that hole, our special effects people, Tim and his crew, had rigged up this big water cannon with like this huge reservoir of like hundreds or thousands of gallons of water in it. He dives through, they release that water, the water cannon fires through, and he's got to, while that water is blasting him from behind, grab that netting and swing his body around as if he caught it and nailed that on the first take. Such an impressive stunt. The whole, like everybody on set just started clapping. Yeah. It was an amazing it was, stunt. And so, it, so Matt Berman, Matt Berman, a great stunt coordinator. Apparently it's genetic because his kid's a great stunt person. We too. should, Matt Berman would be a good guest to have on the show. He would actually, yeah. Matt would be a great guest. So we, we need to, uh, we need to make note of that to get Matt Berman on the, uh, on the show. So now they're trapped in this alien cave with, with underwater uh, with some weird shit happening in their eyes and this dark hole of people that hate each other. And this is fertile ground for some, some fun shit to happen. <laughs> Meanwhile, Bobby's kind of finding her niche where uh, she's kind of uh, been involved with this you know, organized crime where they're robbing Mars of all these things. And what I think is interesting, and I, I really want to hear what you, know, what you think about this or what your interpretation is, but there's this, they're doing a deal. Her new boss, somebody is threatening her new boss that is going to come up behind. He has a, a shocker thing. And she takes the guy, almost breaks his arm, drops the thing, protects the new boss, sends him on. Then the deal is made and it's all good. And she has a little smile on her face. And my understanding of that smile is, you know, somebody that's kind of lost her purpose and been aimlessly wandering and now is utilizing her talents and what she was made for in giving her a sense of focus and purpose is just makes her feel so good. I think I have a little bit of that in a lot of ways. So if I, when I was soon I got out of the military and then I, I didn't have that structured life anymore, you kind of go through like a little bit of angst or as soon as we finish fil- shooting, filming a, a movie or a TV show and you have a purpose and a focus for that time. And then when you're done, you kind of go through that little bit of angst. So you see that smile on her face and you see this like, the old Bobby being revived, and it's really nice to see. I, I agree with everything you just said, and I, I think your own experience, talking about when you got out of the military, you, you felt a little adrift because you didn't have that, that focus and that structure. I think that's absolutely what's been killing Bobby. Is she, Bobby is one, it's, Bobby's a person who has to have something to do. She, all her life, she has been super focused. You know, she, she went to school, and immediately after school, she joins the Marines. And she's not satisfied with just being a a regular run of the mill Marine. She has to fight to try to break into the special forces. She has to, she has to like get into the elite special operations groups of the Martian Marines and be the top of that group. She has to be the best of those guys. Right. You know, uh, she's in the, you know, in the show she's, we're playing her that like she's late twenties, early thirties, but that's very young to be a gunnery sergeant. So clearly she rose through the ranks very quickly. When you take a person with that level of focus and then you set them adrift, I mean, that starts, that kills them. That, it, it, that, is, that is slow death for people like that. I watched my wife go through that when she got her PhD. You know, she'd been in school for over 10 years, getting her undergrad and her, her PhD. And it was nonstop for 10 years. And then she got home and she didn't know what to do. She, it gets that same kind of thing. You just cut adrift. What my wife did and what Bobby is doing, and I'm sure what you did as well, is you have to find a new thing. You have to give yourself a new program. Is your wife an organized crime? <laughs> no, she, yes. She, she, yeah, did, she well, did what Bobby did. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for saying that uh, on the podcast where now everybody knows. Well, based off my shroom story, I'm not an experienced criminal. <laughs> you are not. No, you are not. No, when you go into a life of crime, you're going to get busted your first time out. And you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. That's all. That is 100% what's going to happen. But anyway, I'm just agreeing with you that that Bobby finding this new sense of purpose, even though it is not what she would have picked for herself, just having a sense of purpose and having a job makes her feel really good. You're the only person that I know that's completely immune to that. <laughs> You're like, I could be adrift for the rest of my life and be completely happy. You know? Well, here's the thing. No, but but here's the thing. That's not true, but the things that I need to be doing don't have to be work. Like some people need to be accomplishing something. They need to be working. I don't, I don't need to be working. Like I can sit and I need to, uh, you know, I need to occupy my time. I could sit and read books, watch movies, play video games, run the occasional D and D campaign for my friends. And I would be fine. 
All right, let's so uh oh will you tell me a little bit about the mystery man, their last deal that Bobby uh the Bobby asked him if he served and he's kind of evading her and a little bit and he, yeah. he's not gonna tell him what they're stealing. You talk uh, give us a little bit about that. Who well, is- I mean obviously that's setting up the big plot point for the rest of the season. All right. That they're uh, moving on. They're 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 about to go on a heist that um she is rightly suspicious of. It's a too good to be true kind of job. She's suspicious of it, and it it is connected to some of the other things that are going on in the larger in the much larger picture of what's happening in the solar system. <laughs> so uh, I figured I was inspired by um, Bobby's life of crime, and so I wanted to do gangster movies, uh, yeah. organized crime or gangster movies, because. Man, there's a lot of those. There's so many. So that's, you know, that we got our work cut out for us. And I try to narrow it down to like 20. I know I, I, I even just looking at it now, I know I missed a few, but that's why I do it. And you tell me the ones I missed. But with Bobby doing this, you know, crime thing, sometimes there's movies when I, when I leave a movie like Goodfellas, where it doesn't make me not want to be a criminal. <laughs> it makes me want to be a criminal. <laughs> um, and so I'm thinking of uh, some of these crime gangster movies that I really loved. Obviously, Scarface, Godfather 1 and 2, Goodfellas, The Departed, uh, The Long Good Friday. Have you seen that? Yeah. With Helen Mirren and Bob yeah. Hoxie? Uh, I, I love that movie. Uh, Boys in the Hood, Miller's Crossing, Touch of Evil, A Prophet, the French movie, The Prophet. Have you seen that? I have not. Oh, God, Ty. That needs to go on your list. You're going to love okay. that movie. All right, I'll add it to the list. Uh, City of God, Eastern Promises, The Public Enemy. Once Upon a Time in America, American Gangster, King of New York, The Friends of Eddie Coyle. Now, this was like, it's kind of like a forgotten like movie in like 1970. I've, no, I've seen that movie. Oh, yeah. That's so good. Yep. Robert Mitchum, Killing Them Softly, The Untouchables, The Killing, Menace to Society, Mean Streets, Donnie Brasco, Snatch, The General, uh, The Harder They Come, Angels with Dirty Faces. Uh, the French Connection, Gamora. Yeah, yeah, I know Gamora. That's a brutal movie. Reservoir Dogs, and that's all I have. So that's that's primarily British and, and American movies, uh, and British and American organized crime. There's been a bunch of movies made about Russian organized crime that are just fucking brutal. There's been a bunch of movies made about Japanese organized crime with the Yakuza. Many of those are really good. So like, let's say this is the the Western organized crime list. Cause then we can come back later and we can do the Russian organized crime list or the, the Japanese organized that, crime list. That, that's a good idea. I mean, we got some French movies in here, but yeah, this is the, uh, American English, uh, version of these movies because yeah, there's just, you don't, we don't have enough time to do yeah. all the world's greatest crime movies. There's, there's about a thousand movies about the Yakuza. So yeah, it's been a year talking about those. I think we have to start off with The Godfather, but the, the question is, is it Godfather 1 or Godfather 2? I love Godfather 2. I, and, and Godfather 1 is, is a, is a near-perfect movie. It's a 10 out of 10, so it's not like you're saying it's less in some way. But for me, Godfather 2, the, the jumping back and forth, telling the, the origin story, and then Michael taking the reins in, in sort of a parallel I, I I love that movie. I what are the <clears throat> What are the odds of making a movie which is essentially a masterpiece, one of the greatest mafia movies ever made, Godfather, and probably the greatest organized crime movie ever made of all time, and then doing the sequel to that and creating the only movie that could probably beat the first movie, right? You know, yeah, it's that's pretty some, spectacular. That is a a spectacular one two punch. Yeah, yeah. So we'll put Godfather 2, number one. Uh, and then do we put Godfather number two, or do you think it would be overrepresented in the list? I, you know what I would do is I would just put Godfather 1 and 2 in the top slot because they really are one story. Yeah. And then, in fact, there is, a, there is a cut of Godfather that somebody put out at one point that is one and two, but cut into chronological order. Right. So it really is one story. I would put them, I'd give them the same slot. Yeah. I think we, Goodfellas has got to be on here. Goodfellas is maybe the greatest gangster movie ever made. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's Scorsese at the height of his power. It's got a, a phenomenal cast. Uh, the script is just so tight. Every scene is just a punch to the gut. 
Yeah, got Goodfellas is a there it's a reason why there's a reason why it's probably Scorsese's most famous film. Yeah. I think. Now, Scarface to me it, it, on my personal list would be on there. I know it's not at the level of some of these other movies, but I just love Scarface. I love Scarface too, but I think Scarface is writing a reputation because when it came out, it was so shocking and so over the top. When you rewatch it now with a more sophisticated eye, it's not a super well put together movie. It's got a lot of weird choices and like what? And uh, I just, it's, Tony Montana's Cuban accent is super fucking weird. The script is not as great as you would hope for. Well, uh, I mean, I rewatched it and it holds up for me. I think it's a, you know, I yeah. think Al Pacino is great. I, no, it's, I, look, I love it. Yeah. And when I first saw it, it blew me away. But I watch it now with sort of a more sophisticated well, film watcher's eye. I would, and it's, eh, it's a little messy. I would argue because what almost killed it for me, and I would argue that maybe is killing it for you if you can't put your finger on it is there was a culture in the 90s that worshipped Scarface. And there were shirts, like, you know, with quotes, Scarface quotes. Every house that I went to, in my, that, uh, every guy friend of mine that I go in their house, they have a Scarface poster. And then it yeah. was like that was a thing and everybody worshipped. And that kind of cheese, that, the, the fanship cheesiness of it almost killed it for me. But it didn't. I still think it's a great movie. But because of that cheesiness, it could take it out of the top five of all time. I, yeah, look, it's a movie that I that I really like. I just when I rewatch it, is it on the same level as Goodfellas? Not even closely. Not even. Not even close. Not even close. It's, yeah, I mean, it's well. Let, let, and, so let's, and I'm a De Palma fan, so it's not like I'm bashing De Palma here. Yeah. But, well, let's take it off uh, because yeah. of uh, you know the the cheesy '90s fans ruined it for for us, so it's their fault. <laughs> um, I think number three would be the French Connection. What, what did you feel French about Connection that movie? French Connection is a pretty great movie. Yeah, I mean it's it, it, that was Gene Hackman's blast out into the stratosphere. I'm a fucking rock star now, and Gene Hackman is great. Gene Hackman is is one of our one of our great actors, and it, after that movie, he could do anything he wanted. Yeah, because it was such a powerhouse. Now, I would put a, pro uh, a profit on this list, but you haven't seen it yet, so we'll hold it off. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen that one, which is weird because I, I feel like I've seen all of the gangster movies. Were you, were you an American gangster movie. fan? Yeah. I mean, I, I was. Uh, I mean, look at that, look at that cast. What about, what about The Departed? Uh, I, I did like The Departed. I think Departed is a really good movie. I think it's a shame that's the movie Scorsese got his Oscar for when he, he's made so many other much better movies. But I also, I mean, I, I was a big fan of the Japanese movie uh, that it's based on. And so I'm like, I, I don't think The Departed hit me quite as hard as it did for everybody else. But I will say that The Departed has one of my favorite Jack Nicholson performances. No, he, I disagree. I disagree. Oh, I love I love It's him. one of my least favorite Jack Nicholson performances. I uh, see. I wow, we 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 so disagree on that. Yeah. I love him in that movie. Were you a Boys in the Hood fan? I was. Yeah. I loved Boys in the Hood. Would you put it on the list? Um maybe. Maybe I'm trying to think of of that sort of uh black gangster genre if there's one that I would put above it. Oh, you know what I'm I also, You know what I didn't put on here was uh New Jack City. New Jack City. New Jack City. I was just going to say, I love New Jack City. It's, that is a mess of a movie, but I love it anyway. It's just so weird and over the top, and I love that movie. The other one that I love that is, it came out around the same time as Boy, uh, uh, Boys in the Hood and didn't get as much attention, but I actually think is a grittier, juice, harsher, no, uh, Menace to Society. Oh, what I was going to say is Menace to Society within that time period of gangster movies is my favorite. Yeah, I love Minnesota. I liked it better uh, than no, Boys. Okay, no, I, I the one that I would put ahead of, of both of those is a personal favorite of mine. Not many people have seen it. Is um, uh, what? How, how? Oh, Fresh. I like the the board just flew. Uh, have you ever seen the movie Fresh? Fuck yes, Fresh is the best. See, Clint knows. <laughs> Clint knows what's up. I, tell me, Fresh about, is amazing. Tell me about it. I never saw it. Okay, you uh, you should go into it blind. I'm not going to tell you too much. You should go into it blind. You should definitely watch it tonight. It is a movie about a kid, an orphaned kid who works in and around the drug culture and has a sister that he's trying to save 
from her uh, heroin dealer, sometimes boyfriend. And is also, this kid is also a chess prodigy. Really? And plays, and plays chess with his, oh, his okay. alcoholic father sometimes. His alcoholic father played by Samuel L. Jackson. And decides to concoct a plan to get himself out of the life he's in and save his sister at the same time. And it, he, it, it is illustrated by he's making moves on a chessboard, setting this plan in motion. How have I not and heard of this movie? Because I like- fucking love that movie. I love it. It's got, it's got Samuel L. Jackson, Giancarlo Esposito. Uh, uh, what's her, what, how do you pronounce her name? Her last name is Bush, um, who plays the sister. Enright Bush, I, because I believe how you pronounce it. I could be wrong about that. It plays the sister. The cast is amazing. But it's got this out of nowhere kid, this actor who's like twelve or something, and just crushes the part of this kid trying to find a way out of. And out you of like his it life. better than Menace Society? I do. Oh wow! I do. Now, and I love Menace to Society. I thought Menace to Society uh, was it Lorenzo Tate who plays O Dog in Menace to Society? It was Lorenzo Tate, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. I thought he. I thought that was a powerhouse performance and i was so glad when he went on to be a big movie star after that because i was like that kid when i was watching menace society the first time like that kid needs to be a movie star it was the best thing Um, he ever he's ever done it was the best thing like he was so good in that movie Um, oh i think he's done a lot of good uh, he's done a lot of good work he's done a lot of good works but i think you know you sometimes you have that defining role and then you go on to be a you go on to be you know and do amazing work and be an amazing actor you might even win oscars but that first thing is like the thing that really, you know, that really gets you. I, I still, every now and then at inappropriate moments, will say, somebody asks me something, I'll say, oh, dog is always strapped. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was not a big Mean Streets fan. I know like people are freaking out over that, but I did not think uh, it had the level of. It didn't. It, and it was a very early yeah. work from Scorsese. He was still finding his voice. But a lot of the things that and I didn't, I don't became, think De Niro really knew who he was. Like his performance was yeah. not like the kind of performances that he's done. He's not that charismatic guy that he was trying to be. I also I, well, I was just about to say I think he was miscast for that. Part. Yeah, yeah. Um, he he I, I, and De Niro is one of the great actors, so I'm not bashing De Niro. He's he's one of our greats, but he wasn't that guy. And they, yeah, he was a little miscast for that. But I will say about Mean Streets is the things that Scorsese perfected and became the signature style that made him a giant of cinema for 30 years. You can see the early versions of those in Mean Streets. You can see the seeds. Yeah. I think Miller's Crossing should be on there. Yes. Miller's Crossing is fucking fantastic. I, re- I rewatch Miller's Crossing probably every year. I love that I'll movie. just get this urge to rewatch that movie. And- love this movie. Yeah. All right. So we're at Godfather, Goodfellas, French Connection, Miller's Crossing, number five. Menace to Society, number five? Yeah. yeah I'd put Menace to Society, number five. Um, if you haven't seen Fresh. If, if you had seen Fresh, we would both agree that Fresh is number five. All right. But- um, and if you've seen Profit, the Profit would definitely be on the list. Yeah. I, I'm going to go watch that right now. Yeah. So. I like when you give me movies I haven't seen before because we have such similar so tastes. Yeah, always dude, like dude the pro- uh, Clint or Joseph, have you seen The Prophet? Uh, no, I have not. I'm looking it up right now. It's called A Prophet, and I have seen it. It's great. Yeah. Okay, A Prophet. All right. Well, geez, correct him. <laughs> all right, well, that was our show. Thank you guys for hanging out, um, all eight of you. We appreciate you guys spending your time with us, and I apologize for my partner's scratchy voice here. I think he's got the Omicron or something. Um, I, think, I think my balls are finally dropping. <laughs> uh, so that's it for us, and we'll see you guys next time. Say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.
shine that guy.